morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining class. We'll uh, begin now. Can I ask uh, any one of you to please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Nobody wants to lead us in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Dear Heavenly yes. Father, we praise and acknowledge your holy name. Thank you for this wonderful moment, Father. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to learn and seek you, Father, to grow in wisdom and stature. Father, thank you for this class. We pray for the Pastor Salina. We pray for each and every classmate, Father. We need your divine intervention. We need your Holy Spirit guidance so that we can learn. And, and grow in your own image, Father. Thank you so much for everything. I ask this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Prabhakar. Okay, so we were uh, looking at uh, Romans chapter 8, and uh, we were uh, looking at verse, verses uh, 24 to 28. <clears throat> Okay, and um, uh, in verse 25, uh, we just, we saw last, uh, we saw on Wednesday that, you know, um, uh, Paul talks about the hope that we have. Okay, uh, what is the hope? Uh, though we can't see it now, you know, there is a hope and that's why it's called hope. Um, uh, and the hope is something way into the future, you know, when our, um, uh, our bodies will receive the full redemption. You know, we would uh, receive our glorified bodies. Uh, we would no longer face death, um, uh, but we would receive that glorified bodies when we will receive, we'll see uh, our redemption in full as we have received it in part now, okay? And uh, Paul says, you know, even as we have this hope, we can eagerly wait. And because we have this hope, you know, we can have this endurance and perseverance uh, to go through uh, all the weaknesses of the flesh that he's uh, mentioned, which is spoken about, um, also about the sufferings that he's, uh, he's uh, mentioned and he's, talked, uh, he's spoken to, to us about, and uh, all the difficulties and the hardships that we uh, face. He says, we go through all these sufferings, we go through the weaknesses of the flesh, um, we struggle through in our journey in life, but, you know, we have this hope that in the future, you know, uh, we will receive um, this glorious bodies where we be redeemed uh, from everything that uh, that we are suffering of, uh, from the corrupt, uh, from sin, the bondage of sin, and, you know, from uh, uh, the, you know, the body that is subjected to death, uh, with that which is talking about uh, corruption and decay um, and sickness and pain and suffering and the sufferings that we are having because, you know, uh, because creation uh, has also, you know, uh, fallen because of uh, Adam's sin has also uh, is going into degradation is also you know going uh, slipping down uh, we see corruption in creation as well and uh, death in creation as well as decay and uh, um, you know this degradation of things and because of uh, uh, the fallen world that we live in you know we experience sufferings and pain and he says you know we can Look at all these things with the hope. And what is the hope, um, you know, uh, that we have is in the future, we will receive a redemptive bodies. We'll be redeemed from uh, death and we will receive our glorious bodies. And he says, because of all this, you know, uh, look at that and continue to run your race with perseverance and endurance. And even if you are uh, struggling because the weakness of your flesh or even because you're going through the sufferings, you know, uh, this is going to give us the confidence. This is going to give us the hope. This is going to give us the strength that one day, you know, we would be redeemed. Uh, and then hence we can run our race with perseverance and uh, endurance. Now, interestingly, we see that, you know, uh, Paul moves on or transitions to a uh, prayer. Okay. So in verses um, 26, um, 27, uh, you know, he's talking about uh, 
uh, uh, prayer. He says, and he's talking about another aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit. So uh, in this chapter and in the preceding chapter, in chapter 7, he's introduced us to different, uh, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. He's given different titles to Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Life, um, you know the spirit of christ um uh you know uh so he's again introducing us to another uh, work of the holy spirit and he says the holy spirit helps us in our weakness in our weaknesses okay he helps us in our weaknesses so what is the weaknesses he's talking about here in um, uh, chapter 8, verse 25? Uh, if you look at it in the overall context of what we've been studying or what Paul has been writing in his letter, in his epistle, the overall context of this word weakness or weaknesses is the weakness of, the, of our flesh. Okay, this is the overarching theme, uh, starting from Romans chapter 6, that Paul has been talking about the weakness of our flesh. But in the immediate uh, preceding context, Paul is talking about sufferings at the present time. So what is the sufferings of our present time? He's talking about um, the corruption and decay uh, because creation has fallen from its original intent, design, purpose, and the plan of God. And because there's corruption and decay in creation, and hence, um, we also are going through suffering because that's why you know we all have sickness and disease and you know uh, you know health issues and all of those things and it also can uh, be referring to the demonic work or the work of satan that brings suffering uh, into our lives it can also refer to uh, wicked people who have wicked intentions um, you know who don't mean good for us and so they can uh, you know think wicked things they can bring about their wicked plans uh, against us so there are times when we go through the sufferings of life when we feel weak and we don't or want to pray and we don't know what to pray for and so he says you know whether it's these weaknesses of our flesh or it is the journey of the sufferings of life um, uh, that is happening in the present time um, we can say god i do not know what to pray for in this situation i'm just feeling so overwhelmed i'm feeling so drowned i'm just feeling so down that i can't even uh, say anything i can't even pray my mind is totally uh you know dull it's totally tired and exhausted so um you know there are times when we go through all of these sufferings this weakness of flesh and we don't know what to pray uh you know at those times uh is the holy spirit uh, you know, and Paul is introducing us uh, to the Holy Spirit. And he says the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. He says the same Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of life, who gives life to our mortal bodies, who quickens our mortal bodies, the spirit of life, um, the spirit of Christ. You know, it's same Holy Spirit, uh, you know, is also there uh, to help us in our weaknesses and he makes intercessions for us uh, with groanings that cannot be uttered okay so the holy spirit that is dwelling in each one of us what does he do uh, you know uh, he intercedes uh, for us and he does it with us he does it along with us he does it together with us and he does it through us so it's not just the holy spirit who is uh, interceding or praying for us when we are going through these difficult, challenging situations, sufferings, uh, the weakness of the flesh when we don't know what to pray for. But it's the Holy Spirit together with us, along with us. Okay, so it's the Holy Spirit who puts in the groanings into our uh, spirit man. So he does it with us, he does it through us. So in verse 26, um, Paul says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. So he's also he's also means he's talking about an, a, a different aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, he's mentioned so many things the Holy Spirit does uh, for us. 
uh, he's a spirit of adoption as well. He uh, he testifies to us that we're sons and daughters of uh, of God, that we are heirs with of God and heirs with God and co-heirs uh, with Christ Jesus. So he's also the spirit of adoption. He's also the spirit of life that we saw. Um, and it's the Holy Spirit that helps us to, you know, um, uh, uh, to, you know, uh, to keep the commandments, to keep the laws, which all what Paul has been mentioned to us. So he's saying also helps us. This is another work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He also helps us in uh, uh, our weaknesses. Now, the Greek word for help here literally means to take hold of together with us against. Okay, so that gives us a very good uh, uh, idea and explanation of what uh, this really, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit here is. It says the Greek word really means to take hold of together with us against. So it's the Holy Spirit taking hold of us or together with us against our weaknesses, against our sufferings, against the, the problems that we are going through. So it's not the Holy Spirit, you know, going off somewhere and just praying for, for us, but it's the Holy Spirit together with us, along with us, you know, taking against our weaknesses, enabling us to um, pray. So whether it's weaknesses of the flesh or whether it's the sufferings that we are going through in the present time, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us and together with us, he prays for our weaknesses, uh, which we do not know what to pray for. And how are these... Uh, you know, this prayer coming out says groanings that cannot be uttered, which means, mm, uh, you know, the expression is coming from the Holy Spirit. Its actual intercession is coming uh, in the form of groaning that cannot be expressed in speech. So it can be, uh, uh, groaning can be inarticulate speech. It's not you know, the words that we really speak because we are in a very dire situation, a very the situation where we are down, we are given up and we really don't have the words. So it comes out as groaning means, it comes out as inarticulate speech. It can come out as, uh, you know, it can come out, uh, it can be expressed in tongues, uh, it can be expressed uh, crying, weeping, whatever fashion, you know, it's the Holy Spirit releasing uh, uh, the prayer through the life of a uh, believer. Okay, verse twenty-seven says, "He who searches the heart." Now it's coming back to the heart of the individual. So God is looking into the hearts of the individuals. Uh, so where are these groanings uh, being released from? You know, it's the groanings are coming from the Holy Spirit, but it's released from the heart of the believer, from the spirit of the. Believer. So this prayer, this intercession that helps us in our weakness, it comes from the Holy Spirit and it is released into our hearts and into our spirit uh, as groanings. And these groanings, uh, which cannot be expressed through our own words, you know, just comes out uh, in you know, whether it's expressed through tongues or uh, through, you know, weeping, moaning, crying, whatever. Uh, but it says here that God looks into our heart. That means God knows. And it goes on to say, Paul goes on to say, he knows what the mind of the Spirit is. So God knows what the Holy Spirit is saying or what the Holy Spirit is giving intercession for our weaknesses or to the suffering that we're going through. Because the intercession is the intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So whatever the Holy Spirit is telling us, we need to know always that it's not from him, but it's coming from Jesus is according to the will of God. And it's hence, it's a perfect intercession. So even when you don't know what to pray for any situation, uh, you don't even know what to pray for. You can just pray in tongues. Because, you know, uh, when we're praying in tongues, we're actually praying mysteries, which is mysteries to us, but not mysterious to God and to the Holy Spirit, because they know. And, uh, you know, uh, we were just speaking those mysteries, which is accordance to, uh, you know, God's will plan in, uh, uh, for our lives. It can also be we speaking to our situations, the problems, the difficulties, uh, God. And we're also speaking what God is orchestrating 
uh, towards our difficulties, towards our situations, towards our problems. So it can be all of these things, but it's mysterious to us. But what we are saying is in alignment to God's plan and purpose. It's in alignment to his uh, divine will. And even though it's mysterious to us, it, it comes into our spirit man, it's released into our spirit man by the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, we can also receive answers. So the Holy Spirit can also give us solutions, to the problems that we're looking to, answers to the difficulties that we are uh, going through, okay? So God looks into the heart and this kind of intercession, what the Holy Spirit does for us is perfect intercession because uh, we are praying according to the will of God. We are praying just as God wants us to uh, pray, okay? So uh, in this verse, we see who is having the weakness. Who's going to the weaknesses? It's we, right? We, the saints, okay? Who is helping us in prayer? The Holy Spirit. Who is, uh, how is he helping us? By making intercession along together with us, okay? Who is doing the intercession? Who is doing the intercession? Yeah. Yes, correct, uh, Siddharth. that it's the believer who is doing the intercession with the help of the Holy Spirit. So where is the intercession coming from? It's coming from the heart of the believer, but who has put that in the heart of the believer? It's the Holy Spirit that has put it in the heart of the believer. And who's listening to us when we're interceding? God is in, listening to us and he already knows what is in our heart and mind because it is put in by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit reveals the mind of Christ to us that we read in the preceding uh, uh, verses. Okay, So uh, uh, God looks into the heart of the believer. He knows what the Holy Spirit is saying. He, uh, he knows the mind of the spirit, and this uh, intercession we know is uh, is in accordance with the will of God. Um, okay, so we see that the Holy Spirit helps us in, uh, to pray in our weaknesses according to the will of God. It comes out as groaning, uh, uh, and it's prayer that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's been uh, expressed in inarticulate speech. It's not something that believer, because inarticulate we're saying is because it's not coming from the mind of the believer, okay? He does not bring up these things, but it's coming from the heart of God. I mean, the, uh, and the Holy Spirit is releasing it, and these warnings can be expressed uh, in tongues, through crying, weeping, whatever fashion. But what is the result of this kind of prayer? It is accordance to the will of God, okay? And what does it do also? What is the result? It helps the saints in their weaknesses, gives them answers, solutions to their uh, problems, okay? So the light of this, you know, uh, looking at Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things to work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose, okay? So these are the sufferings that uh, you know, we're going, all of us are going to suffer in the present time. Uh, we are going through this, but, you know, uh, this is our confidence. What is our confidence? Not only that we will have receive full redemption of our bodies, but Paul also says that our confidence is that all things will work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So when we go through sufferings, difficulties, and uh, tribulations, trials, you know, this should be our hope. This should be our confidence. This should be something that, uh, you know, we can endure through that, you know, in all things, God is going to bring out his good. Even though we go through the suffering, we are not able to see anything good. But God will bring out something good. The ultimate result will be something that he brings out, uh, which should be good because, uh, you know, uh, we love God. We're called according to his purpose and also you know uh, what he brings out will not just be something good but will also be that God's purposes will be brought about in and through the sufferings and the difficulties and the tribulations that we um, go through okay uh, because we are loved by God and we're called according to his uh, purpose so all things will work for our good amen 
So this is our great assurance. This is our great hope. This is something that we can hold on to. This is our anchor when we go through sufferings, that all things will work together for good. And whatever is happening, you know, uh, you know, God's purposes will ultimately be fulfilled uh, and his purposes will be brought about in our lives. So that can give us the endurance and the perseverance uh, to go on. Then he says in verses uh, 29 and 30, what is his purposes? What is God's purposes? So can somebody please read uh, verses 29 and 30, please? For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Thank you, Asha. So uh, just beautiful, uh, you know, uh, verses here and what Paul reveals to us. He says, for whom God foreknew uh, is basically talking about the omniscience of God. God is all knowing. He knows everything. He says that whom God foreknew, he also, he also predestined. Okay. So that means he predestined means that he planned before time. Now, everything that God uh, uh, planned uh, to happen in history that we, we are seeing unfolding uh, before our eyes, uh, you know, or will happen way in the future is something that he has you know, done arbitrary. That means it's not something that he does randomly, comes up with some idea now. But it's everything that is something that God has already planned even before the foundations of the world. So even before we even were conceived in our, mo in our mother's womb, you know, uh, even before the foundations of the world, God even knew who you would be, what you would do, what your choices would be, where you would go, and all of those things. So he knows everything. He, you know, uh, all the days of our life are, you know, uh, in this book, even before even one came to being, okay? Uh, so uh, he's planned everything beforehand, before time. He's decided everything. Uh, so what did he predestine? He predestined means he did not predestine our choices. Now, this is very important for us to understand and catch. Okay, God did not predestine the choices that we will make. That means he did not beforehand, before we were created, even before the creation of the world, he did not predestine. That means he did not make it our choice. He did not uh, destine Adam and Eve to make the wrong choice. It was their own choice that they were going to make. But did he know beforehand that they were going to make the wrong choice? Yes, but he did not make cause them or he did not make them to make that wrong choice. They are able to understand. Okay, so he predestined us before the creation of this world. He knew beforehand what are the choices each one of us are going to make. Okay, so he did not say, okay, I'll get Asha to make these choices, to choose me, to believe in me, but I'll make Kum to refuse uh, and not accept the gospel. So that's not right, because when we're saying that, we're saying that God is a partial God, which is a, going against his very nature. So predestination basically means not that God makes us choose, but he has given us the free will to choose okay so that is why i said last uh, last week last friday he created us in his image that means he may give us his, uh, his, a mind of our own a mind that we will be able to think and understand and discern what he is saying he gave us a will uh, to choose that is why he created us in his image that's what it means in his image okay a will to choose he helps us to choose when we go to him and say god what do i choose he helps us he gives us the leading and the guidance through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, uh, to the audible voice of the Holy Spirit, to the inner voice of the Holy Spirit, to prophecies and to the gifts of the Spirit. But, you know, he does not make us choose what we choose. It's our own choice. Okay. So he predestined means he did not, uh, you know, make the choices for us, but he predestined means he knew the choices that we are going to make. So he knew that each one of us are going to choose him as our Lord and 
savior. He knows who is not going to choose uh, him as Lord and uh, savior. And um, and those, you know, um, he, uh, uh, he predestined, he also conformed to the image of his son. So he knew beforehand who is going to choose him. And those who choose him, he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. So it's all of them who by their own will, their own choice, choose Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, those he predestines to be conformed to the image of his son. So it does not mean that God, you know, predestines each one of us to uh, choose him, some of them not to choose him. No, that's wrong. The choice is for everyone. So God knew before time our choices. Uh, so we are the ones who are making the choices. God does not determine the choices that we make. Uh, he does not determine uh, the choices that we make. He knows the choices we are going to make. Uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, he uh, he knows who is going to choose him, who is not going to choose him. But those uh, whom he knows are going to choose him. His conform going to conform them to his image. To con conform them to the image of his son. Conform them to the image of Jesus Christ. Okay. So those who make this choice, they will be made in the image of Jesus. And that's why he says, because he is the firstborn among many brethren uh, so it says that we should be like our brethren of jesus like jesus like so we we would become like jesus that is what god has predestined for us that we would be like jesus okay so verse 30 says more moreover whom he predestined these he also called whom he called these he also justified and whom he justified you know he says that he these he also Glorified. So all who become like Jesus, they are the ones uh, who became who will become the called. Okay, those who make the choice uh, uh, and choose Jesus as their Lord and Savior, these are the people who will become the called of God. So the question is that does God only call those He predestines, or does He call everyone, or is the invitation extended to everyone? So the question again is, does God only call those he predestines or does he call everyone or is the invitation extended to everyone and those who respond to the invitation are those who are called? Okay, to everyone. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's extended to everyone. It's extended to everyone. No, yes. Go God doesn't discriminate against anyone. He desires that all everyone come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So yes, it's extended to everyone. Yes, thank you. Uh, so it's God's uh, good, uh, pleasing will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He calls everyone. Does that mean God knows ultimately who is going to be saved and make it to heaven? Yes, because he knows beforehand the choices that we each one of us uh, will make. Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, we need to answer this question. This is very important because one school of thought, uh, you wanted to say something, Sidan? Okay. So one school of thought says that God has already predestined things. Uh, he's predestined who are going to be saved and uh, they are going to be the called. Now, if this is true, then there is no need for us to preach the gospel. Right? There's no need for us to busy ourselves and to give our lives to preaching the gospel because, you know, we already know, okay, these are the ones God is going to predestine, who is, he's already predetermined, you know, uh, they're going to be saved. So they will, they will just automatically be saved. Let them be saved. Why do we have to spend our time and energy uh, doing this? But that's not what the New Testament tells us okay the new testament tells us jesus tells gives us a command go into all the world and preach the gospel preach teach and make disciples in you know uh, to all okay that was even the command that he gave the great commission he gave even before he ascended to uh, heaven you know preach the gospel to uh, to everyone and also the so the invitation is open to all uh, we have to go and preach the gospel to every creation. Uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that 
whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life so jesus died for everyone but whoever believes in him so the invitation is basically open to all anyone can believe but the ones who believe they are the ones who become the called okay the called ones they are the ones who god formed you to be predestined or whom he called to be predestined to the image of his son because he already knows that they're going to make this is a choice they're going to make okay and those he calls he also justifies what's the meaning of justifies he makes them righteous right standing with god we also saw what are the benefits of the right standing in grace right standing with god okay and those he justified he also glorified so what's the meaning of glorified Okay, just in the preceding verses we saw, you know, uh, uh, made? Made, his made his children, correct, yes. Uh, the, how are we glorified, which means we become heirs of God, with God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus, okay? So that is uh, the glorious redemption that uh, we can have. That's what Paul uh, talks about, the glorious redemption, which is which means we become hairs and joint hairs, jo hairs uh, with God and joint hairs with uh, Jesus Christ, okay? So this is how he, you know, just beautifully just uh, sums it up. Um, so it's very important for us to know, uh, because there are many theological arguments about the predestination. Many of them says, uh, you know, say that, um, God actually caused Pharaoh's heart, you know, to be hardened so that he can uh, display his uh, miracles, he can display his glory, which is not fair. But uh, it's not God who hardened Pharaoh's heart. I mean, that's how it's written in scripture. But Pharaoh basically had a hard heart. God knew that. And God knew the choices he's going to make. And it's not that God is going to harden his heart, which means if you're saying God is going to harden his heart, that means God is cause, going to cause him to, to sin. God cannot give us anything that he does not have. God does not have sin. He cannot cause us to sin, right? It's totally going against the nature and the whole theology of who God is. So God did not, when we read it, we can't literally say, God, see, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It's written in scripture. It means that, you know, Pharaoh's heart was already, he was a hard hearted person. God just used him. Uh, uh, and, you know, his stubbornness, his hard heartedness, he was not letting go, but he just used it to reveal his glory. Now, God does not need to use our sin to reveal his glory, right? He's a holy God. He does not need to use our sin to reveal his glory. Uh, glory or his power or his might okay uh, irrespective of that he does not need to use us or our sinful attitudes to show how righteous how good how uh, holy he is it's 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 a wrong uh, theology that we will be preaching so it's important to for us to know that you know wherever it says god caused them to do this uh, and all of those things you know, uh, uh, we also saw that in healing and deliverance, God put the sickness on this person, that person. It's not that God put the sickness. He can't give us sickness because basically he does not have sickness. Um, uh, but it's because of, you know, we saw the various reasons. In the same way, we interpret this uh, likewise. Okay. So uh, God does not predestine the choices that we make. We have the free will to choose. That is why Adam and Eve chose the wrong but, you know, God already, did God knew that he's, they're going to make the wrong choices? Yes. Did he have another plan? Yes. He was unfolding his, uh, his other plan. He brought about his other plan and he's still executing his plan. Uh, you know, even though we can go away from his plan and his will, but he can still unfold his plans uh, uh, in our life even today. Yes, say you had your hand up. Yes, Pastor. Would it also be correct to say, in addition to what you said, is that God knows all the possible choices that we can make, and where He's never caught unawares of what we choose at the end of the day? Yes, yes, He knows uh, the the different uh, choices that uh, there before us. He knows what are the choices that can harm us, that can seem good to us, but can harm us, and that is why. Or, you know, he's given us the Holy Spirit. He says the Holy Spirit is your teacher, your guide, your counselor. He will lead you. He will guide you into all truth. 
John chapter 16, John chapter 14. Uh, we read that and we also see that, you know, he guides us into all truth and the Holy Spirit will also uh, reveal things to us and tell us, you know, uh, things to come and also will remind us what Jesus has uh, taught us about. So it's the work of the Holy Spirit and uh, we know through, you know, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, through the uh, inner voice of the Holy Spirit, the audible voice of the Holy Spirit, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we can receive guidance and leading in every area of our life, small and big, uh, significant and insignificant as well. Okay, Louis says, Pastor, if God knows the choices to be made, why extend invitation to all? Is God trying to justify his sovereignty? If God knows the choices to be made, no, he does not want the choices to be made. He knows the choices we are going to make. That's a difference in the statement uh, you are saying and I'm saying. God already knows the choices that we are going to make. It's not that God knows the choices to be made. It's not that. God already knows the choices that we are going to make. Yes, but in irrespective of the choices that we are going to make, God, the invitation, the gospel is still going to be preached to everyone because he knows who are going to hear that gospel and who is going to make the choice. So God is not trying to justify his sovereignty. He does not need to justify anything about himself to anybody uh, because he is God. Uh, he already stands justified, doesn't need to justify. So uh, we need to correct these statements. It's not that God knows the choices to be made, but he knows the choices we are going to make. And because we are going to make those choices, he pre predestines us to be called, to be conformed to his image of his son, to be justified and to be glorified. Okay. I hope I answered your question, Louis. Yeah, okay. Uh, say uh, you have your hand up. Yes, so Pastor, in other words, what you're basically saying is that God knows the choices we are capable of making, all choices. So again, he's not caught on our ways. Regardless of what choice we make, he already has a plan. He already knows what to do. He's never caught on our ways. But at the end of the day, he leaves us to make that choice. Yes. Am I correct to say that, ma'am? Okay, yes, he uh, he knows the choices that uh, we are going to make because he's given us the free will to choose, the gift of volition to choose. Yes. Yes, somebody else has their hand up. You can go ahead. Who's hand is uh, Yes, sir, is Pastor. I, I just want to ask you a question now with regards to the predestination. Mm -hmm. So if we are praying for someone and, um, you know, um, how are we able to maybe through one of the gifts of the of the spirit get a get a sense that um, that this person has already been predestined that he will not be saved, uh, you know? And then uh, we should do we still continue? I mean, can we can we make the change? Can we change that uh, that uh, you know that predestination? Um, uh, uh, you know that will that will uh, affect, if that will affect this person. You just wanted to understand from that point of view. Yeah, but see, the thing is, we don't know, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether that what choice that person is going to make. Maybe that person, uh, you know, hears the gospel uh, for say fifteen years of his life, twenty years of his life, and uh, we have people like that, right? Fifteen, twenty years, they're born in a Christian family. They don't. Their parents are praying, crying out for them. And then, you know, uh, one fine day, they just, uh, they just accept. So we don't know who are these people. God knows. But we don't know. But, you know, we can still go ahead and, and uh, pray because that is what we are called to do. That's what uh, Jesus says. And, you know, he says, uh, uh, I know who are going to make the choice. So I'm going to lead them and show you who to go. He would have said that in that mandate, you know, in the Great Commission. He, he says, go into all the world, preach the gospel, preach, teach, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he says, go, go to all the people, preach and teach. He doesn't say, I'm going to show you who uh, is going to, you know, choose me, the X, Y, Z, who's going to choose me, to them you go. But he says, just go preach the gospel uh, to everyone. But he knows, you know, ultimately he knows who's going to make the choice. Yes. 
then why intercede for people to be saved? It's important to uh, uh, to pray for people, to intercede for people to be saved because, um, you know, uh, uh, God knows that, you know, they are they will choose but you know there's things that are hindering it can be the work of the devil like we saw even our sufferings that we're going through uh it's because of uh, we're living in a fallen world creation is fallen and we're suffering because of that slow it's we just catch a viral fever or you know we uh many people died with covid because it was just in the air um uh, and also uh, uh, you know uh some of the problems is demonic oppressions what satan puts in our lives uh, sufferings it can be also wicked people uh, who come in, in in the garb of being nice people and we think they're nice people but to turn out that you know they really fooled us so uh, yeah it's important that you know uh, we pray for people so that their eyes are opened uh, to see the truth that is in jesus christ so, uh, you know, we need to pray, we need to make intercession for people so that, uh, you know, they can be saved. So that, you know, uh, the blindness that covers their eyes is removed and they're able to see the light, see the truth in uh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. So they will be saved no matter what, because they are predestined. If God knew that uh, everybody is going to be predestined like this, then he would say, he would never have told us to preach and teach the gospel. And we would never see the uh, uh, the early apostles and believers going to such persecutions. And son. even Jesus would not have come down to the earth. He would have just come down, died on the cross and gone. He would have not preached about the kingdom of God. He would have not revealed the father heart of God to us. He would have not done signs, miracles and wonders. He would have not preached about the kingdom of God. See, why do we preach and teach? So the people will know the truth, they will come to the truth, they will accept the truth. So it's not for us to say, okay, uh, God knows when also let him save them, save him by themselves. No, we are called to do it. We will do it. That's how God has planned it to be. <laughs> okay, I hope I answered your questions. Okay, um, uh, if there are no more questions, we will move on. Um, yeah, yeah, just uh, just one question, one other yes. clarification. So in our prayer, uh, you know, we should not really, uh, you know, try to sort of, you know, get an understanding of whether the person is, you know, being predestined to be saved or not saved. Um, I'm just thinking that, you know, if, if we were to ask that question and for some reason, I mean, maybe through, a, through the gift, some gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, maybe through the gift of knowledge or whatever, we get an indication of that, or can we get an indication of that so that it, it uh, you know, it makes us uh, uh, sort of, you know. Um, I don't think uh, the, whole, the Holy Spirit will indicate that about us. He will just, see, the gift of the Spirit is basically to edify the church, to, uh, you know, to strengthen, to exhort, uh, to build up uh, a person. Uh, it's not to put them down and discourage them. So revealing this about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit will never do. It. You know, he will reveal even, uh, just say this person's sin is hindering, will not even reveal the, the deep intimate sin of that uh, person. He might reveal it to the person, but not to you. Uh, so you don't stand as a judge, but you just say, okay, I just sense that the Holy Spirit is saying, there's some sin you can, you know, just you and God, you can uh, confess it. But what do we see from scripture? See, we always need to interpret scripture in the light of other scriptures. So what does our scripture tell us? Scripture tells us that it's God's good, pleasing and perfect will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It just says all men be saved. So we don't say who are the ones show us, who are not the ones show us. It's God's perfect will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We just go with that. We just speak into that. We just pray into that. And we just want to see that fulfilled. And all of them will come to the knowledge, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Does that help? Yes? Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to verses 31 to 39. Uh, so here in verses 31 to uh, uh, 39, uh, you know, uh, Paul is putting together all that he has spoken, uh, you know, uh, 
so far in uh, the chapter so far, you know, because he's going to shift to an entirely different theme in chapter nine. So this is kind of, these verses are kind of a, a, a grand conclusion of putting everything together, tying up everything to um, uh, gather, everything, bringing everything to a closure. And he uh, Paul wraps it up and he goes into this, you know, celebratory proclamation. Um, he's saying, uh, here is all that God has done. And and I'm celebrating everything that God has done. So he's bringing everything to a perfect conclusion. All that he has spoken, uh, because there's going to be an entirely shift uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the theme that he's going to speak about in chapter 9. So he's, uh, he's uh, putting forth four rhetorical questions here, which he has done several times throughout in this episode, which is something unique in this Roman episode where he's asking this rhetorical questions, where he asks the questions and he himself gives the answers okay uh, so what are these questions these questions can be questions that comes up in the mind of people or the questions he would like uh, like to come up in the minds of people and uh, and because he wants to summarize the main things that he has been writing so far or saying so far so verse 31 what then shall we say to these things if god is for us who can be against us so he says we know that we all go through sufferings and hardships um uh, weaknesses in our flesh, you know, but we all go through this, but what is our response to all of this? So he says our response is if God is for us, who can be against us? So this is the first assurance that he gives us. If God is for us, who can be against us? The second thing is in verse 32, he says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not with him also freely give us all things. That means, how will he not along with the son, you know, when he given us his only son, how will he not along with him graciously give us all things? So you know, we have this assurance of God's presence that God, when if God is for us, nothing can be against us, which is an assurance of God's presence. We also have here an assurance of God's provision. That means when God did not hold back his only son, you now how will he not along with him you know, graciously give us all things? So while they're going through sufferings in the present times, while we are waiting for the adoption of the glorious redemption or of the glorious liberty that is coming up again, that hope that we have, while we're going through all the sufferings, the weakness in our flesh, the tribulations, the difficulties, we can say, God, you are for me. If you are for me, nothing can work against me. And, you know, that is God's presence. And say, God, I have your provision. You know, when you gave your only son, how will you not, along with him, graciously give me all things? Amen? Okay? So God will provide for me. God will also be with me. So God's presence and God's provision is the assurance, the hope that we have when we go through sufferings, tribulations, and uh, difficulties. Okay? So the next question he asks in verse 33 is, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So, you know, Paul has already explained this whole truth about justification. And so he sums it up uh, with this. He says, look, God has justified you and me. And because he's justified us, no one can accuse us. No one can condemn us. There is no accusation uh, against us. Okay. Uh, just to finish the last two uh, verses, if you could just be with me, you know, verse 34 and verse 35, he says, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So Paul has already explained to us that Christ was dead, buried, resurrected, ascended. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And what is he doing there? He's making intercession for us so we live with the sense that we are justified and the one who justified us and made us righteous is at the right hand of the father so there's no way anyone can bring any condemnation or accusation against us and even if they bring it against us nothing will prevail and then he talks about the love of god he says that the love of christ you know nothing can separate us from the love of christ and paul says you know, uh, in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, Paul has been saying that hope does not disappoint us, okay, because the love of God is poured out in our 
hearts. So this hope is consolidated, it is strengthened because God's love is poured out into our hearts. So here he's saying that I'm so, so assured of this love. Uh, that is why I have this hope. This hope is my, the hope that I have about the future things that is going to take place uh, is undergirded by the love of God that has been poured into my heart or is poured into our hearts. So we are so confident of this love. And then he talks about all the troubles and tribulations in the in verse uh, uh, 36 to verse 39, it talks about the natural things, uh, the spiritual things that happens, nakedness, famine, persecution. You know, he says, even neither death nor life, angels or principalities or powers, which are talking about spiritual things. He's talking about neither height nor depth, nothing in all creation, which is a natural things again, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So he says the love of God, which is poured out into our hearts, we know that nothing can separate us from this love of God. Nothing in the natural realm, nothing in the spiritual realm. Okay. Um, and he says, whatever we are going through is going, we are going to come out as more than conquerors. So, which means Paul is saying we are not just going to be victorious, we are going to be more than victorious. Whatever we go through in life, we are going to come out victorious, we are going to come out more than conquerors. And nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And he says, this is what gives us the hope. And hence, he brings us to this grand summary of chapters, of all that he's written from chapters 5 uh, to 8, which is, uh, you know, he basically uh, celebrating, proclaiming all that God has done, uh, everything that God has already done for us, and what is the hope that we have. The hope we have is his love. Uh, and nothing can separate us from his love and that we can be more than conquerors, more, more victorious, uh, and that we can be more than conquerors to him who loved us. Okay. So that is amen. Yes, amen to that. Thank you, Asha. Uh, I hope you enjoyed chapter eight. It's just such a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, piece of literature of the revelation that Paul received that we could just... Uh, you know, chew on, but I hope it will just become a reality in our lives. Okay, any questions anyone has? Any questions? So, have a good, if there's no questions, we'll, yeah, yes, Louis, yes, go ahead. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, class. Uh, I just want to ask a, I don't know whether it's um, a use of language, but um, Romans 8, um, 33, 34, 35, started with woo, woo, woo. Um, if you read 35, it says, um, who shall separate us from the love of God? Now says tribulation, distress. I thought woo was supposed to be a personal uh, pronoun, if I'm correct, in, in English yes, language. Um, who is he that should, condemns? Rather, she now said, who, um, he, he uses as a person, but the things is quantifying are tribulation, distress, persecution, famine. I, I thought it was supposed to be what? It's a woo. So is it just a semantics or it's just accurate? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So because you're asking only 34 and 30, uh, 33 and 34, and it, the 35 also has the who, but it qualifies the who there, you know, tri tribulations, distress, persecution that can come through. Uh, through, uh, through uh, people, uh, angels, uh, demonic beings, uh, we're talking about the spirit realm. So that who is uh, uh, already explained to us uh, or, uh, you know, qualified for us here. But the who here can bring any charge against God's elect, can uh, be the accuser himself, who is Satan. Uh, you know, who is he that condemns? You know, he condemns, he's an accuser. Uh, so it can also refer to him, it can refer to the demonic beings um, that accuse us, or it can also bring, uh, it can be people, you know, the wicked people or uh, uh, people who do not know Christ, who, you know, accuse us, okay, or who condemn us, it can even be them, people of the world as well. So talking more about the natural and the spiritual realm. Uh, okay, Nas, it can you. also mean no one, nothing. 
Yeah. No uh, one, nothing. But just as a word, I'm saying. So nothing and no one can come against the whatever relationship God has given us with Him in Christ Jesus. Yes. Uh, no one can st uh, stop that relationship, that intimacy, that blessings, uh, our spiritual standing, who we are in Christ, where we are placed. Yes, no one can discern. It's 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 something that we've received by grace. But here he's asking, you know, the who can it be people? It can be people in the natural realm. It all also can be people in the spiritual realm. You can have Satan, demons who stand, charge against us, condemn us, accuse us. We can have even people, even sometimes even fellow believers who can condemn us, you know, uh, for uh, things that we have done just to put us down, put our ministry down or talk ill of us. So uh, anyone, you know, it can be. So who can bring charge against God's elect? Yeah, like uh, uh, for Jesus, it was the high priest, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, you know, who stand and condemn. It was the people themselves. You can refer both to natural realm and spiritual realm. Did I help answer your question, Louis? Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. I'll take care of them. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, any more questions? Okay, if not, uh, we'll, we'll end class. Thank you all for patiently uh, staying through for uh, an extra eight minutes. Um, have a blessed uh, weekend and just live in the, celebrate, uh, you know, everything that God has uh, proclaimed and, uh, you know, purchased for us on the cross. Live that life um, in the fullness of the spirit. Okay, thank you everyone. God bless you all. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.